Hello and welcome to this very special edition of the podcast, My Extraordinary Family. Uh, and I'm here today with a very special guest, uh, Olivia Graham, who has just been announced as the new Bishop of Reading. Olivia, many congratulations. Thank you. And uh, obviously the last few weeks you've known uh, about this appointment. Uh, how are you feeling about taking on this really significant new role? Tremendously excited, uh, daunted, privileged, um, uh, very energised actually mm. when I think about what's coming. Mm. Um, uh, it's very interesting taking on this role in an area which I already know quite well. And very unusual actually. And Yes, yeah. um, because it means that I know perhaps almost too much about Berkshire. Mm. Um, so it's going to be fascinating uh, making the transition into being in Berkshire, but in a different context, different role. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as you've thought about this, obviously you're transitioning from being an archdeacon to, to being a bishop. What do you think are the main differences between the two ministries? Well, I've, I've talked in the past about um, an archdeacon's role being sort of in the boiler room shoveling the coal on the fire and making sure all the cogs connect and making sure the machinery keeps turning. Um, and a bishop's role being more like being on the bridge mm. and being able to take a, an overview and yeah. look out at the horizon and check out what weather's coming and okay. see how to, uh, to navigate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what are you most looking forward to uh, about the new role? I think it's the opportunity to have a ministry which is more outward facing. Mm. Um, the ministry of an archdeacon is necessarily quite focused on the workings of the church. Mm. And, uh, and my um, passions have always been um, much more focused on the world mm. and the church's interface with the world. So this really is my dream job right. in terms of trying to bring those two things together. Yeah, fantastic. And I, can I say how pleased I am? you're coming into this role and uh, I've really enjoyed uh, working with you uh, over the last three years as Archdeacon uh, and uh, look forward immensely to uh, a different kind of partnership uh, into the future. I'm very, very excited uh, about what this means for the diocese. But tell us something about your story of faith and how long you've been a Christian, how you came to faith uh, as a Christian disciple. Mm. Well, I'm what they call a cradle Anglican. Mm. I was brought up in a small village in Kent and every Sunday we trekked off to Matins in the village church and every Sunday afternoon I was sent off to Sunday school and collected the stamps. Mm. And, um, and I carried on in that... You collected the stamps? Yes, this do you remember green, Sunday school? Green shield stamps? No, no, no. no. Do you not I, remember Sunday school no, stamps? No, I don't. No, no. <laughs> I expect many people listening to this will know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were very uh, exciting and they were on a roll and you yeah. got given a different stamp every, every Sunday. Um, I went to boarding school when I was 11 mm. and I was confirmed at boarding school and I was a very pious little girl actually. Mm. Um, but I was very deeply touched by the mystery of the... Um, eight o'clock communion service in a cold, cold place. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and, the, and the sense of otherness, the presence of God, mm. that, that's always been with me, really. Mm. But when I was about 15, I suppose, I woke up one morning and thought, what a load of baloney that is. You know, mm. How can anybody who's intelligent possibly imagine that God somehow became human mm. and lived among us? Mm. And, and that started off a period of about 10 years in the wilderness, really, during which I um, went overseas and did all sorts of things. But it wasn't until I came back to England when I was in my mid-20s and went to university mm. that I found my childhood faith again and uh, approached it with adult questions. Wow, that's interesting. And did that happen through a particular local church or through reading or a dialogue with people? It was triggered by my godmother challenging me when I had been asked to be somebody's godmother mm. and I was enthusiastic about this and she said to me, how can you be a godmother if you don't believe in God? Wow. Um, which made me think mm. and I thought, good point. So I went and talked to the university chaplain mm. and over a period of months we met and talked about faith and he was very... Uh, easily able to deal with all the questions and doubts mm. that I had. Mm. And I think one of the key things he said to me was not to worry about all of that, mm. but just to go with it. Yeah. Um, 
and that's always been important to me not to worry about mm. um, about doubts or contradictions yeah. or uh, things that don't seem to add up mm. uh, because as long as the basic belief that God is there that God is love that God is in us and is everything mm. it, it, as long as that's upholding us then yeah. I think God can deal with the rest that's really interesting interesting yeah. role of challenge in yeah. the faith journey as well because yes. uh, and sometimes we're quite hesitant to challenge yeah. each other, aren't we? Yeah. And, and was it soon after that that you felt the call to be ordained, or was it quite a long period of time? No, it wasn't. By the time I went to university, I'd been overseas for in Africa for about six years. And when I graduated, um, I went back to work in Africa. Mm. Um, I worked in Djibouti for a couple of years, and then in Somalia with Oxfam. Yeah. And it was actually while I was in Somalia that... Um, one very hot evening in the middle of a power cut, a group of us were sitting around in a dark room with just candles mm. and some warm beer. Yeah. And we were just, for want of any other entertainment, um, asking each other what we thought we'd be doing in 10 years' time. Right. And, and it came to my turn, and I heard a voice saying, I think I'll be ordained. And I kind of looked around in astonishment and wondered who'd said it. And it was you. And it was me. Yeah. And right. I don't know where that voice came from. It was yeah. not something I ever consciously thought about. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't indeed for another um, eight or ten years that I was ordained, but, yeah. but it was a very important moment, that, because it yeah. made me start wondering about it. So you were working in Africa at the time. Tell us something about what your job was uh, then. At that time I was working in Somalia as Oxfam's deputy country representative, mm -hmm. and Oxfam had a big um, programme of development activities there, mostly soil and water conservation mm -hmm. and income generation and also uh, ran relief programs when needed. And there was a major drought while I was there, and so we were running a feeding program in the pastoral areas in yeah. the centre of the country. And I went from there um, to back to England, actually, and, um, and started a new Oxfam unit, which was based on networking across Africa mm. in the sub-Saharan countries. Mm. Uh, and the idea was that um, all over Africa there are... Um, development workers who are nationals of that country, often not very well educated, often with no resources, who are solemnly reinventing the wheel because they don't have access to all the information that um, the international mm. aid workers have got uh, about how to tackle some very common problems across mm. the region. Mm. And so it was, a, it was an information sharing uh, network mm. and we organized exchange visits and um, easily digestible information and so on. Mm and ran that from England for a while, but then they moved the whole unit to Senegal. Right. And by that time, I was married to Keith, and yeah. Robert was a baby, mm. and so we all moved to Senegal for a couple of years. Wow. That's, I mean, I know you have a passion for Africa and for the church throughout the world, actually, because I was in... Uh, you've been looking after our Kimberley and Kuraman link for uh, several years, and I made a very memorable uh, visit to yes. Kimberley and Kuraman with you a, a couple of uh, years ago. Um, uh, what is it from that that you bring to your ministry as a bishop? Well, perhaps it's just that global perspective. Mm. Um, and it's a perspective which helps us to see in this country how very fortunate we are in so many ways. Mm. Um, and not to forget the impact that our actions have on the rest of the world. Mm. I think we can get, as a country, rather parochial, rather inward-looking yeah. about those things. But we were together in Kimberley mm. a couple of years ago, and one of the things that I know we were both really touched by mm. was, um, was the account of how environmental change yeah. in Southern Africa yeah. is impacting people there now. Yes, yeah. When I was working in Somalia, there was a major drought about once every seven years, seven mm. to ten years. Mm. Now it's about every two to three years. Mm. And I know that's, that's a picture across Africa. Yeah. Climate has just become so unpredictable mm. and major weather events just devastating mm. for poor people. And part of my learning there was, was that uh, we speak a lot about the average global warming temperature being kept uh, below 1.5 or 2 degrees. But the average means uh, actually the nearer you are to the poles, mm. the, the more extreme that becomes. And it's much, much higher and the consequences much, much worse. Mm. So you, you were ordained, and you've actually served all your ordained ministry, I think, within the Diocese of Oxford. Yes. What are the different jobs that you've done? Well, I was an Oxford ordinand, as you say, and I, I served my title post uh, first year, diaconal year, um, in Garsington, mm -hmm. um, because my third child was born um, somewhat uh, 
uh, unexpectedly, let's say, uh, just before my ordination. Right. So as a tiny baby, six weeks old, my, uh, my daughter Sophie came on my ordination retreat. Mm. And because um, it was in those days uh, deeply frowned upon for young curates to have young children in their arms, mm. let alone to be breastfeeding them, um, I, I was, the, the curacy I was supposed to go to had been withdrawn. Oh, nice. and, um, and the only solution that was possible was for me to do a non-stipendiary mm. first year. Um, so I stayed in, in, uh, in the village that I lived in, in Wheatley, and, and did my first year in Garsington, and uh -huh. then moved to a stipendiary curacy in Princess Risborough, mm. where I had two and a bit gloriously happy years, yeah. and went from there to be the Vicar of Burnham mm -hmm. in South Bucks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you became Parish Development Advisor? Yes. Uh, for... Uh, the Dorchester Archdeaconry. Well, it was then the Oxford Archdeaconry. It was the whole of Oxford yeah. and yeah. Dorchester. Yeah. So yeah. it was quite a big area. So you know the Oxford yes. and Oxfordshire part of the diocese really, really well. And then how many years as Archdeacon of Berkshire? It's coming up for six. Okay, okay. Yeah. One of the things that was really apparent when we were doing the consultation about, uh, about the new bishop and doing the listening was that people uh, wanted somebody who really knew what it was like to be in mm -hmm. parish ministry in uh, this part of the world and knew what some of the pressures were and uh, what I guess Pope Francis famously calls uh, uh, pastors who smell of the sheep, uh, as it were. <laughs> uh, and, and you clearly have that from that, uh, fr from that uh, knowledge, really. So one of the things you've led for in the diocese has been uh, our Flourishing in Ministry project, and that started uh, well before I arrived. How did you come to be involved in that particular aspect of diocesan life? Well, when I became Archdeacon in 2013 and joined the Bishop's staff, I was given the brief of um, clergy well-being. Mm. And we already, in fact, had quite a lot of good provision in place. Yeah. We had work consultancy, we had conflict resolution teams, we had um, the provision of counselling when it was needed. Uh, but what we didn't have, really, was the example of, of senior staff showing the, the clergy, what it was like to look after themselves. Mm. And I think we've become much better as a senior staff mm. at doing that. Mm. And when you came into post, um, and it was time to relaunch the, the effort mm. uh, with new energy, yeah. uh, you were modeling something, I think, rather different, and, uh, which was really good to see, mm. and giving all of us permission to, okay. um, to take better care of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I remember the question I was, most, the question I was asked most um, when I was going around the diocese in my first year doing what you're about to do in Berkshire probably, it was, uh, surprised me, it was, uh, do you take your day off? Yes. Uh, uh, to which I answered yes most of the time. And then people would ask me a follow-up question. No, but do you really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what do you do? Yeah. So let me turn that into a, another question for you, which is um, how, how will you watch over yourself? in this very demanding ministry that you're about to enter into? I do take my day off. Mm. I take my day off very seriously. I treat mm. it as Sabbath. Mm. And sometimes I take two days off. Mm. And I encourage clergy to do that as well, because yeah. I think sometimes we just need more downtime yeah. than 24 hours yeah. in order to recalibrate. Mm. Because for those of us who've got to do domestic maintenance and um, shopping and pay attention to children or grandchildren, mm. as well as pay attention to spouses and our relationships, as well as pay attention to ourselves, yeah. sometimes 24 hours a week isn't long enough to do that. Yeah. So yeah. I'm quite good at taking the time off that I need to take, yeah. diary permitting. But of course, the key thing is that we should be in control of the diary and not the other way around. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, and are you bringing any particular uh, priorities into this new ministry, any, anything you particularly want to deepen or, or see shaped, particularly for, for Berkshire? There are a lot of challenges, and I think the common vision uh, focus areas are really helpful in drawing our attention to what they are. Yeah. One of the things that I'm really passionate about is children and young people, and particularly young people of secondary school age and, and a bit older than that. And I'd love to see uh, a, a, a greater engagement between our church communities, our people of faith and young people, mm. either in school or out of school, mm. at a particularly crucial time in their lives. 
And it's a time when young people are asking questions about all sorts of things. Yeah. Um, in spite of the bad press that they sometimes get, the young people that I encounter are deeply serious mm. and, um, and really engaged with the world. Yeah. Yeah. And we need to join in with that, mm. join in with that energy and that seriousness mm. and partner with them and see how we can offer the resources of faith into their development. Mm. So you've been through uh, this uh, process of discernment about, about uh, the possible call to be Bishop of Reading. And uh, uh, we know, and people uh, listening to this will know, uh, what that process looked like from the outside. But, but how did it feel from the inside? And how did you discern God's call to this ministry at this time in this place? I don't think there's an easy answer to that question because my experience of call is that it's always multifaceted. Mm -hmm. It's partly about trying to listen carefully to what God's voice is saying, mm -hmm. but also trying to listen carefully to, to who God's voice is speaking through. Mm -hmm. And I've been really fortunate to have people around me who have been wise and, I think, prayerful, mm -hmm. Uh, and who know me well, and who know what the challenges of an Episcopal role are well, and uh, have guided me to think about it in ways in which I couldn't perhaps have thought about it myself. So that's been really helpful. But it's been a very long process. I started wondering about this Episcopal ministry uh, several years ago, and, and put it completely to one side, and didn't pick the idea up again until we had a conversation probably two years ago now yeah. and then it sort of unfolded and even going through the process I think the discernment is ongoing it's not that that uh, that I had the experience of saying yes I'll I'll try that mm. and then uh, I was sure about it it was very much a, a developmental mm. process mm. and of course there was a lot to think about in terms of whether it's it was sensible or even possible mm. to make a transition from being the archdeacon yeah. in an episcopal area to being the bishop mm. Mm. but i've been very encouraged by uh, other people mm. in in coming to believe that actually that is a good yeah. a good move to make yeah. Yeah. and it brings with it advantages as well as some disadvantages mm. Mm. and i think the advantages outweigh yeah 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 that, no, that's really helpful uh, and i think some of the things that made me um, uh, encourage you along the path to think about Episcopal ministry, not particularly uh, in Reading, uh, were your evident commitment to uh, prayer and to uh, the ministry of the word and preaching and sacraments. The, the bishop is the chief minister of word and sacrament uh, for the area and uh, for the diocese. And I think uh, uh, that seems to me to be the center of your ministry rather than uh, the, some of the things an archdeacon uh, has to do. Mm. I ask everybody who comes uh, on this podcast to just say what they've been learning about being contemplative and compassionate and courageous. And we've talked about compassionate in your uh, ministry in the World Church, and I know you're deeply contemplative. But, but I do want to ask you what you've been learning recently about being courageous and what you think you might need for the future? Well, I think it's needed courage to take this, mm. d this vocational step. Mm. And I, um, I have prayed very hard for that courage. And I'm hoping that courage will not desert me as I make this transition into an Episcopal role. Mm. I think the bishop has to be a person of courage mm. because there's, an, there's a need to, at times, speak out and, mm. and speak things which are going to be criticized. Mm and to be a prophetic voice. Mm. And the prophets were hugely courageous people. Mm. Mm. So that is something which I need to, uh, to pray for more of and to cultivate yeah. and yeah. to take the example of courageous people around me as well. Yeah. And who, who are your models and examples? Where do you draw that strength from? My hero is Desmond Tutu, uh -huh. whose ministry I have, um, I guess, observed for probably 20 years. Yeah as it's grown and developed, and he's grown and grown old mm. and, um, but, and never lost his sense of humor mm. and his sense of humility mm. um, and his sense of deep, deep belovedness mm. um, 
uh, he, there's a man who, who knows he's deeply loved by God and mm. transmits God's love to everybody he meets, mm. whilst being an incredibly courageous voice yeah. in the apartheid years. Mm. Um, and, and since then, in mm. the way that he has held power to account. Mm. Mm. Uh, so that for all sorts of reasons, Desmond Tutu, <laughs> I think there's going to be a need for courage in the way that um, I raise my voice and mm. use my voice. Yeah and the voice of our churches and our people of faith mm. in order to speak into public debates mm. uh, on issues that really matter, like poverty mm. and social injustice mm. and the environment, which yeah. I know is a cause close to your heart as Indeed, well. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. And, and what can we pray for for you, especially over these next few months when... Uh, you're going to take some time out from your archdeacon role and come back, uh, as it were, as uh, the bishop for your consecration uh, in November, and then the six months that follow when you will be getting to know the people of God across Berkshire uh, in a new way. Uh, what should we be praying for for you? I think wisdom mm. and a quiet mind mm. and that I will be more Christ-like in this new role. Thank you. That's great. Well, let's pray now. Loving God, thank you for uh, Olivia and for your long call on her life uh, offered in service to you. We pray your blessing upon her in this season that she may indeed be a contemplative, compassionate and courageous bishop in your church. And grant to Olivia and to her family a peace and a quiet mind in this season, a knowledge of your love and the love and support of your church, and your peace as she adjusts and changes to this new ministry. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord.